Well, good morning, everybody. Come on, how many are ready to go to the Word? Amen. Come on, I know I am, and I'm excited to preach to you today. Um, I uh, am thrilled with what God is up to in our church, and I hope you are as well. Uh, as Pastor Lisa mentioned a minute ago, if you're a guest, we're so thankful that you're here. Um, and uh, But uh, beyond the guests, if you're just in the room, I am thankful that you're here. Uh, and uh, so thankful for what God is up to. Um, I... I want to go to the Word this morning. We're in a series called Crossing Rivers, Taking Cities, uh, and we're in the book of Joshua. Today, we're going to move into chapter 2, and um, I'm looking forward to just continuing to unpack what the Word of God would have to say for us as just some reconstruction in our lives is going on, reconstruction in our church. And uh, uh, by the way, a couple things that you should know. Uh, I've told you about a lobby remodel project. We're going to update our lobby and nine bathrooms. Everybody say nine bathrooms. And I think we should give the Lord a big hand for that. Amen. Uh, we, were, we were hoping to have um, all of that done before Succession Weekend, but we just decided in wisdom to pause on that project and, um, and, and wait for the, the, the closing of a sale of property that we have been um, uh, working on the sale of for quite some time. It's a property that was donated to us up in the state of Washington um, several years ago. We were trying to just think off the top of our head. It's probably been about eight years ago or so uh, that property was given to us, and it's been through a, a process of just preparing it to sell at the best dollar that we could. And uh, this week, it's actually not only been an escrow for a couple of weeks, but uh, the buyers waived all contingencies and is ready to close. And uh, it will close uh, assuming everything goes through this week. Um, you, you just never know until the day it actually funds. But um, it's on or before the 20th, and uh, that would be Friday, by the way. And so this week is Miracle Week. Can I hear an amen about that? This week is Miracle Week. You've been praying. You've been contending. We decided to wait until that was closed so that we had cash in hand and didn't get ourselves extended too far. We decided to err on the side of wisdom. And so um, we're going to be able, we have to wait now until after Succession Weekend, and we host a big conference called MFI, uh, which is our, our heartbeat for pastors for the nations of the world. And so we're going to have um, close to a couple thousand pastors come in from all over the world right at Succession Weekend, and many of them will be here for that uh, service on that Sunday night of October 6th. We'll host them for a conference that week, and when they go home, we're going to go to work, and uh, I believe it's just going to be an amazing thing to see that all come about. So I think a couple things. I think we ought to just um, pray for these final days of detail, that there'd be no hiccups, no challenges, no anything. Uh, I, I get asked regularly by the church, because I had been asking you to pray. So it's miracle week. Let's pray that that miracle sails through right to the end today, man. Come on, would you pray with me for a minute as we get ready to go to the Word? Father, we thank you, God, that you have called us to cross rivers and take cities, and you've given us lands and houses and people to use in a manner, God, that would bring glory to your name. And I, I pray, God, as the elders made this decision to sell this and, and to take the assets and make sure that we upgrade our facility and we pay down some debt and we do a variety of different things, I just pray, God, that you would uh, bless and cover the sale of this property. I pray that these final details would come together this week and that there would be no hiccups, no challenges, no problems of any kind. I pray, God, that you would be with us, and uh, I pray, God, that um, the, the title company and all technical details would sail through in the simplest and easiest transaction that they take care of all week long. And God, I just pray that in this, you would receive all the glory, God, for funneling these funds in and uh, allowing us to do this remodel project and the other things that we're gonna do. And I just thank you for it today in the strong and in the powerful name of Jesus, amen and amen. Come on, could we give the Lord a hand for that today? <laughs> amen, thank you very much, Titus. Um, as we go to the book of Joshua, um, I want to just give you a little bit of a reminder of where we were last week. First of all, um, you would know maybe just from biblical history 
that um, uh, God had rescued his people from Egyptian slavery. Um, they'd been in slavery um, for many years, and Moses was called by God to lead them out. He himself had wandered in the wilderness for a long time, had developed a stutter, was basically kind of isolated in a very difficult place, and God spoke to him through a burning bush that it's time uh, for, for God to take his people out of Egypt and take them into their inheritance, into their destiny, and into the promised land. And Moses went, and God sovereignly pushed them out through a series of plagues, pushed them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. That was the first uh, crossing of a body of water. That crossing of the Red Sea is symbolic of our leaving of Egypt, which is, by the way, forgiveness of sin and, and, uh, and, and breaking off bondages in our life. And when we get water baptized today in the New Testament church, we're not leaving natural Egypt, we're leaving spiritual Egypt. And that's the first uh, baptism that we experience. It's a baptism of repentance. But there's another baptism we go through. There's another river crossing that uh, the prophet Joel spoke about, that Peter preached about on the day of Pentecost, and it's a baptism of power. Uh, it's a Holy Spirit baptism, and it's an endowment of power that takes us into promised land. It takes us into destiny. And uh, we need to understand the book of Joshua because it's a representation of our life in Christ. Um, we still have our Moses encounter and our uh, experience of repentance and forgiveness of sin, but then we need to cross over into our promised land. And um, Joshua and Caleb had been sent by Moses along with 10 other spies to go spy out the land, and they came back with the report of how wonderful the land was, like it was growing fruit that uh, a cluster of grapes was so large that it took a pole and two men to carry it. Like this was so significant. Um, and and maybe, maybe you've had an experience like that. You've gotten a little indication of what God's promises for your life might be. And you see how big, how significant, how, how great those promises are. But where there's great promises, there's going to be great battles. Warfare always matches the work. Whatever you're called to, you've got to expect that there's going to be enemies that try to wipe you out. They try to chip away at your house. They try to rob us of the next generation. But the people of God have got to learn to not only cross rivers, but take cities. We've got to be destiny-minded. We've got to be purpose-minded. We've got to be warfare-minded. What happened is 10 spies came back and talked more about the size of the giants and the overwhelming odds that were stacked against the people of God while Joshua and Caleb talked about God who was bigger than the giants. And the truth that you learn by that story alone is whatever you magnify will either deplete your courage or increase your courage. You've got to understand this principle. Whatever you magnify, you magnify the giants, you're going to deplete your courage. If you magnify God, who's created all things, more powerful than the giants, then you're going to enlarge and increase your courage. What happened in that period of time is their courage got depleted. Forty years of wandering in the wilderness ensued. They didn't get to cross over into their land. Now Moses is dead. The end of the book of Deuteronomy and the start of the book of Joshua, you find the announcement, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now Joshua... The work still remains. The destiny is still intact. And I just want to say to you today, Manor House, I don't know what you've been up against, what's died, what's over, what conflict you faced. There's another chapter for your life. There's another chapter for, your, for our church. There's another chapter for our calling in God. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, as long as you're part of a spiritual family, and you can rally with a sense of faith and inheritance, you've got to come to your Jordan River and realize though God's workmen die, though difficult things happen, and grief needs to ensue, and the past is gone, and we've had to wander for a season, and you've had to watch some people die, at the end of the day, you come to the Jordan River and God raises up new leadership because though his workman dies, his work still continues. So there's something that God wants us to get 
into our spirits today as you come into chapter two to realize God's gonna take them in. God's gonna take them in. And I wanna just prophesy to you today, God's taking you in too. This is a picture of what God wants to do with your life. So Joshua chapter two, verse one says, Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at the Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who've come into your house, for they've come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied. <laughs> Interesting, she lied, by the way. You're gonna see she flat out lied. And, and, and she's listed in Hebrews 11 as one of the hall of fame of faith women. I, I love it. She's even in the genealogy of Jesus. I, I don't know what that does to your theology, but let's just read the scripture. <laughs> yes, the men were here earlier, but I don't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk. That's where the lie starts. They, they left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. <laughs> don't you love the humor of the Bible? Actually, she'd taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath the bundles of flax she'd laid out. The king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. But the spies went to sleep that night. And Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. And listen, listen to what she said. Because this is going to have everything to do with the things I'm going to say to you this morning. I know the Lord has given you this land. Hmm. Somebody on the inside already knew what was coming. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We're all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror. This is a snapshot into your enemies. Everyone in this land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. She's talking about close to 40 years earlier. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. She's actually recounting things that happened under Moses' leadership in a former day, and that has shaped the mindset of the enemy. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. Listen to this. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you'll be kind to me and my family since I've helped you. Give me some guarantee that not if Jericho is conquered, but when Jericho is conquered... You will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we'll keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they've returned, you can go your way. Before they left, the men told her, we'll be bound by the oath we've taken. Only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope. Commentators say because they were so specific with their words, this scarlet rope, it was unusual, it was different, it was specific. It was almost as if they brought it when they came in. And they said, this is very unique and very specific. It's the only thing that can save you. It's the only thing that can mark you. You have to leave this scarlet thread hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, your mother, your brothers, and your relatives must be here inside the house. 
If they go out into the streets and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside the house, we'll accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we're not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but the, they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. Isn't that powerful? There's three principles that I think are in this portion of scripture that are going to help, I think, a generation of people who want to boldly respond to the Lord's unique call on them. I think that's what this chapter is about. It's about a generation of people. It's about a community. It's about a local church. It's about a family. It's about a man or a woman who just simply says, in my day and in my time, I want to do what God has called me to do. I want to take the land. I want to conquer the land. I want to live in my inheritance. So here's the three things we're going to talk about. Number one is that prophetic promises, they require strategic partnership. They require it. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. The second thing is that God is at work before you even arrive. The third thing we're going to talk about is that we should always expect God to redeem the impossible. Always expect that God will redeem the impossible. And the title of these three points today and what I'm sharing is simply this. It's when destiny is in your hands. It's when destiny is in your hands. It's not Moses' day, it's Joshua's day. When destiny is in your hands. The first thing that I see in this portion of scripture is that Joshua took two spies and he sent them into the land. Isn't it interesting that Joshua took two instead of 12? Joshua took two spies and sent them into the land. He watched what Moses did. Moses took 12. Is that bad? Is that wrong? No, I don't think it's wrong. But Joshua took two. I actually kind of get hung up on the idea of spy right there. Like, like if I'm just reading the scripture and I get to the word spy, I just stop and pause. I, I dreamed of being a spy when I was a young boy. Like it takes me back. I grew up in a very small farming community and I go back to the house that I grew up in and a friend down the road whose parents were dairy farmers and uh, I loved to go to their house because they had endless buildings and equipment and, and, and all kinds of things. Like I loved to hang out with my friend Tony. I grew up with Tony. Tony and I are still friends. We connect from time to time. But I wanted to be a spy and his house was the perfect spy house. A magnifying glass, like a pad of paper. We had those things, the really cool little hat. Like, I don't know if spies really wear those things today, but I know that um, those were things that we had. And I remember going through the buildings, and we talked about being a spy. Um, I remember uh, watching and, and recording um, Tony's siblings every move and we'd sit at dinner and we'd flip through our little notepad and explain what we saw and what they were doing and what what nations they were trying to conquer and I remember Tony's mom nicest lady um to, to be honest to this day I don't know what her name was we called her cookie but I think her name was cookie because she made good cookies I I actually think that's that's why that's why we called I think all of the friends just called her cookie and she just didn't change that. But anyways, um, we, we were sitting, she was the nicest lady, but she would just roll her eyes at us. Like, you guys, this isn't like um, an episode of the born supremacy. Like, that's not what this is really all about. This is just a farm on a little island in the Columbia River. I remember one day running past uh, his dad and, and, um, and throwing ourselves onto the hay in the barn to turn around and write the license plates of his truck down on the piece of paper. Like, we didn't become spies. 
Nobody ever hired us to be a spy. I went to Portland Bible College, he went to WSU, he got a degree in agricultural science, I got a degree in theology. Like we, we went two completely different directions. My, my favorite movie series of all time is, is the, the Bourne series. Jason Bourne, like I, I love Matt Damon in those series because there's something about the CIA life and it wasn't just the CIA life, like his life was he was a CIA agent but something cracked and in the process they tried to get rid of him and when he woke up he didn't even know that he ever had been. So now he's an old spy being hunted. Like spy land is a complicated land. The only series I ever owned back when we did DVDs, my wife bought me the whole set one year for Christmas. I like almost cried. I'm like, this is such a great series. Thank you. Thank you for buying me this. It's what I always wanted to do with my life. Like that's kind of what this is. Give me like a spy level series like that. I mean, it's on the level of cult documentary. Like it's like at that level. I think, I think the reason why I was so enamored growing up about that kind of life and, and thinking through that kind of, of lens is because I like to win and I like to find a strategic advantage. I like to find things that the enemy um, maybe overplays their hand on and I like to capitalize on it to gain some victory. Um, I, I like to win. How many know what I'm talking about? Nobody internally like celebrates when they fail. Nobody internally is like, oh man, that was a day right there. No, you have to choose to say in my failure, I'm gonna learn something, why? Because you wanna learn so you can win. You want the advantage. And I don't know how much of scripture, like I, I think if I could just take all of the times in scripture where God is trying to give us an advantage. He gives us an advantage by grace he gives us an advantage um, by spiritual gifts. He gives us a prophetic advantage by the Holy Spirit to see things that nobody else sees. All the while, he's trying us to gain, he's trying to get us to gain an advantage over our enemy so that we win. His intention is that when destiny's in your hands, you would have the tools at your disposal to gain the advantage to take the ground and win. Now, win in the kingdom might not always look exactly like win in your mind. You see, we can win even when there's loss. I don't know how it all works. We work in this upside down kingdom. I just know this, that when it comes to who you partner with, and who you go on a spy journey with, and who you try to take advantage of the enemy's tactics with really does matter. Because your perspective and what you see and the advantage you're looking for, not everybody in your life will be able to see with you. Listen to this, Joshua chapter one, verse 10. Joshua commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp, tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days, you'll cross the Jordan River. Something about um, that moment in Joshua, he knew we're about to cross the river, and when we do, we're gonna take possession of the land the Lord our God is giving you. But Joshua knew, I can't just tell the leaders to get the people ready, I've gotta have a fresh report so I can't just partner with anybody. We need a pivot point advantage of somebody who's brought inside information that will align and help us get where we need to go. So Joshua, his first principle that he operated by is that prophetic promises require strategic partnership. Now you've got to hear me in this. When, when a moment of destiny comes for you, maybe it's a business opportunity, a serving responsibility, a speaking opportunity, uh, maybe, maybe you're um, uh, uh, in, a, in a dating relationship that's about to turn into a marriage, maybe there's a prophetic word that's over your life. What you do to break through barriers and get into the next level of life, I don't believe is ever one at the level that it could be alone. God wants you to know 
who's falling in rank around you, who can organize the people to move. So you need that kind of partnership, but you also need strategic advantage people who can help you see into the future, foresee where the enemy might be, and prepare in advance to conquer the enemy before you ever even get there. When you come into these moments, we run the risk of minimizing the moment. Hey, God said he's going to take us. Get everybody in order. We don't need a word from the inside. We've got it all on this side of the river. I'm not sure they would have had the level of advantage they had than those two spies coming back saying, hey, by the way, not only are we going, but we're going to a land where everybody's already afraid. You've got to hear me now on this. Um, prophetic promises require strategic partnership. There's no prophetic destiny that will be reached in our lives alone. God never intended it that way. Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, how could one man chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight? There's some kind of multiplied advantage when one person joins with another. Listen to this in Ecclesiastes 4. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. If you've been burnt in a relationship before, like Joshua had, it's hard to give it another go. How many know what I'm talking about? When, when, when you have had 10 of your close friends, you thought you were in battle together, and somehow those 10 didn't come back with the same report, it's hard to keep your heart pure. But Joshua somehow in the process not only didn't get corrupted by the enemy, he didn't get corrupted by the 10 who brought back the evil report. I think he probably had to work on his heart. I think he had to work on his thoughts. I think he had to work on his confession. I think he probably had to forgive while he was wandering in the wilderness waiting for those people to die. But the principle was still in his spirit. I need, and I'm gonna just say it this way, this way, you need several to serve beside you, plus two to help you see what's ahead. I think we need people beside us, and we need people who can look to the future with us. Not everybody who serves beside you can see the future with you. And I don't think we have to tell everybody around us everything that we see about our future. But if you don't have anybody in your life who's saying, we can do this, I see the future with you. I actually see what the enemy's doing and he's already shaking in his boots. Then I pray that God will begin to give you those kinds of people. Sometimes we take our vision and we pour it out to 10 spies who are critical of your future. Can I say shed those relationships quickly in Jesus' name? Get around people who build you up. Get around people who speak faith into your future. Get around people who see what the enemy's trying to do to wipe you out. Get around those kinds of people. And when somebody gets critical in the process, say, I actually don't have time for this conversation. Begin to manage your partnerships. Begin to manage your relationships. We're talking about moments when destiny's in our hands. We need people of faith who actually see the enemy. We don't need people of faith who don't have some sense of, of understanding about what's really going on in life. Listen to Joshua 1, 10 and 11. It says, Joshua commanded, go through the camp, tell the people uh, their provisions are ready. Three days you'll cross the Jordan, take possession of the land. It was in those days. So I got, he's, I've got people beside him but then he takes this window of times and he says, a little smaller group, get over here and let me see the future together with you. So yesterday's pain can't dictate today's relationships. Can I say that again? Yesterday's pain can't dictate today's relationships. Oh man, I've had some people abandon me at, at, at the highest points of life. 
Moments where you're just on the precipice of God doing something great and somebody gets critical and they walk out the door. Can I tell you something today? What we need is we need to not allow yesterday's pain to dictate today's relationships. Listen to this now. It can inform them. It cannot control them. I need to take yesterday's pain and allow it to inform today's relationships, but I can't come under the control of yesterday's pain. The second I do, I allow a root of bitterness to grow, which actually, the Bible says, will begin to take root and grow and cause trouble in all areas of my life. So destiny is a team sport. If my wife and I went through what we went through over the last couple of years and didn't have people to partner with us, I don't know where we would be. There was a morning I got up uh, when we were at the worst of the worst with our daughter. If I told you the story, it would would be unnecessary. But at the end of the day, let's just say it was the worst of the worst. And I got up one morning and I literally thought, I don't have the strength or the courage to open my mouth and pray a prayer of faith. And I felt so guilty. This was my first thought when I opened my eyes. I thought it's gonna take all the faith and the courage that I have just to put my feet on the floor. And so I did. I thought that's my first step. I'll just get my feet on the floor. Darkest time of my life. I got my feet on the floor I reached over and picked up my phone and there was a message from a man named Elijah Sotvinder from Malaysia. Michael and I went to school with Elijah and his wife in PBC and in the middle of the night, because of the time change, Elisha and his wife and their kids had had a prayer meeting for what was us the middle of the night. For us, it was a time where they were awake and they prayed and they worshiped and they prophesied over our family and over our daughter, and over our sons. And I hit play, and I just listened to somebody else praying when I couldn't pray. And I realized when destiny's in your hand, you better put partners with you who can see the future. And they look at your enemy with you And they say the enemy's in terror. God is bigger. And they begin to report back to you. It's going to be okay, Daryl. I went to the future. And I see already where we're going. And it's a good land. And you're going to make it. And I remember that day realizing that in our weakest moments, we need some spies. We need some prophetic spies. We don't just need people who gets, gets the job done. Oh, we, we could come in this room and put on a service and serve. That's great. But where's a generation of spies? People who get their notepad out, they put their hat on and their magnifying glass and they say, oh, I've been through the streets of Portland. They're afraid of the, they're afraid of God. They're running in fear. And and if you'll rise up, men and women of God, the land is already ours. It's already ours. It's already ours. Verse 1 of Joshua 2 says, Joshua secretly sent out the spies from the Israelite king. He didn't even tell Israel. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side, especially around Jericho. I know that whoever speaks in your dreams and speaks to your dreams, we should have some understanding of how to choose those people. They, they should be people who have overcome giants in their own right. Do they have any wisdom? Do they have any experience? Are they risk takers? Are they faith people? Are they influenced quickly by the voices and opinions of others? Can I trust them in that space is the question that we have to ask. So we've got to rid ourselves of bitterness of the past and then we have to evaluate who gets to be in that space because partnership is so important. 
The second thing that I see from this portion of Scripture is that God is at work before you even arrive. God is at work before you even arrive. When the spies got to the city of Jericho, they found a place to stay. It happened to be an inn. Some people are try to try to argue that maybe Rahab wasn't a prostitute. The Bible's very clear that she was. Yes, they went to a very um, challenged and very difficult place in a sinful city that was not at all God-fearing. There's no way that those spies could have lodged in a public place. They had to go to a place that actually had some level of secrecy to it, a place that in an attempt to cover them and keep them safe, they could go to. What they didn't know is they'd even find a partner there. God was already at work before they ever even got there. And I'll be honest with you, I, I was preparing this week and I felt like some of you need to understand God is already at work in the realm of his promise towards you. God is already at work in that space. Some of you are single and you've, you've longed to be married. Can I tell you, God's already at work in that space. Some of you are praying for a, a business breakthrough. God's already at work in that space. God's already at work. Listen to this, Joshua 2, verse 8 to 11. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land. Over the course of years, over the course of years, God had worked that mindset into this prostitute named Rahab. Just waiting every day for the day that Israel would cross the Jordan River. Year after year after year, wondering. But she had already come to the resolve. I know God's given you this land. He's already at work. We're all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. We've heard how the Lord made a dry path for you very end of that, again, I'm just going to read it again. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Come on, that's so powerful. If we can arrange the right partnerships, the right relationships, and realize God's already at work, maybe what we'll see is that God has taken past victories and caused them somehow to be transmitted across the desert over many years. Specifics of former victories have reached the ears of the enemy. And the enemy has mulled those things over. We talk about our thought life all the time, but have you ever stopped to realize the enemy of your soul has a thought life? And, and the thoughts that he's pondering are either the lies and deceptions he's hurling at you or the truth that you're proclaiming towards him. What had happened is somehow all of those thoughts had reached these people's ears, the inhabitants of Jericho. And, and, and the principle of this is simply this, that word about previous miracles travels to the enemy's ears. I, I, I think... If I can take this principle and begin to build on it, I would say every miracle that's happened, the enemy watches, and he knows they happen, and he knows God is supreme, and he knows God is all-powerful. He's wondering whether you're going to come in, in God's power or in your own strength. And he wonders if you're going to show up and believe that the giants are bigger than the God that sent you there. And he knows that becomes the pivot point. So here's the key truth that I want to uh, draw out of this, is that the Lord doesn't just perform miracles to get you out of Egypt and past the enemy's lines. He performs miracles, and he uses the report of them to make forces that will withstand you in the future tremble. What he wants for the church is that we would collect all of the victories of the past and use them as weaponry to move into the future. What got you here? What did, the, what did the Lord do to bring you this far? What miracles got you here? Those become like an arsenal of weaponry that when courage leaks and strength fails, we can embolden ourselves again. 
I stand in the power of the God of might. Um, the Bible's very clear about this principle. Um, it, it's very clear. The Bible says that we're actually supposed to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. This woman, Rahab, actually believed that the Lord had already given the land to them. So I want you to see this principle, and then we're going to move on, and uh, we'll, we'll end. When victories happen, the enemy hears about them. When the people remind the enemy, the strength and the courage of the enemy is depleted. When we listen to the report of the enemy, our strength is depleted. I wonder what would happen if we'd be a people who came into battle first filling ourselves up with all of the miracles of the past. I wonder if we just reminded ourselves, you know what got me here? You know what saved my soul? You know what delivered me from bondage? You know what I saw God do here and here and here and here? When those 10 spies looked at the giants more than the God who was sending them, their courage was depleted. I think the pivot point for victory is your courage. Will you have courage that's founded on the miracles of God and the promise that he sent you? Or will your courage be depleted by the size of the enemy? I think today's a day where the Lord wants to say to you, arise, church, and begin to take courage and stand in a place where with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. I think what we need to do is say, you know, devil, <laughs> the Lord made this promise to me. And I, I'm standing strong in his might and his power. My shield of faith is not based on my strength to use it. It's I'm standing strong in the Lord. I just have courage to activate the shield of faith. I have courage to put on the belt of truth. I have courage to put on the helmet of salvation. I have courage to take a step of faith into territory that I've never been in before because the last time I did, the Lord brought me this far. And if the Lord brought me this far, he'll take me that far. And that needs to begin to be our confession. Because the Lord has already front-loaded the enemy's mind with that reality. The enemy's just asking, are they going to get strong and courageous? The answer is yes and amen. Everybody say yes and amen. amen. I want the band to come back as I deal with this third point. It's simply this, always expect God to redeem the seemingly impossible. Always expect it. Always expect it. Rahab, the spy, she's there. She knew destruction was imminent. But redemption is the buying back of something that was lost. What happened through the scarlet cord being hung out the window and the covenant that was made and her declaration of faith. Listen to her declaration of faith, always expecting God to redeem the seemingly impossible. Joshua 2 says, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. She believed that, that God's promises would be fulfilled because God was supreme over all. That confession of faith was a prostitute's conviction based on what she had heard transfer across the desert over 40 years. Somehow she come to the place where she realized if God is with them, God isn't with us. And if God isn't with us, I want to be with them. Here, here's the point that I want to make in, in, a, in a spirit of faith with all conviction and confidence as your pastor. I think there's some people that you feel like and that maybe I feel like are irredeemable. They're, they've gone too far. Prodigals, too distant. Maybe there are situations, scenarios, they're, they're beyond God's redeeming ability. I want you to know that God's already working in them. He's already softening their hearts. He's already stirring their faith. He's, he's already working in those situations because we should always expect God to redeem the seemingly impossible. I think God specializes in hard cases. 
I find it interesting that the spies went into a house that was built into the wall. The walls of Jericho were so large, people lived in the walls. In a matter of days, those walls are going to come crashing down. Not by human strength, but by the Lord's mighty hand. What those spies knew as they stepped into that house in the wall is they're stepping into a place that was marked for imminent destruction. But God's intent was to redeem even in the midst of destruction. Rahab would be mentioned by the author of Hebrews later as part of the great hall of fame of faith. Hebrews 11, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she'd given a friendly welcome to the spies. Can I tell you, some of you are going to begin to stand and proclaim, you're not going to perish. You're not going to perish. You've been wondering, are they going to perish? Your conviction is going to turn to a courageous confession because God is bigger and God's already working in that space. And here's the principle is that the Lord will use the darkest places as an incubator of his prophetic promises. That's why I get so excited about the Pacific Northwest. People say, oh man, it's, it's, it's like, God's left the Pacific Northwest. No, he's at work in the Pacific Northwest. We just need some faith-filled, courageous people to rise up in the middle of it and say, we're gonna prosper in a dark place. Our faith has gotta be in the God who put us here. It's got to be in the God who sent us here. Can I hear an amen? How many have a situation in their life you feel like is outside the realm of of possible? You've just begun to maybe even confess that situation. It's impossible that God could even move there. Just be honest with me. You've kind of named some things as impossible. Come on, lift your hand. Just lift it up. You've named some things impossible. I prophesy to those things right now in the name of the Lord Jesus that possibility is going to begin to arise in those situations. Those those people that are saying no are going to begin to say yes. Come on, that banker in that business deal who actually pushed the contract to the side and said there's no room for you here. They're, They're going to pull that contract back. They're going to sign it in Jesus' name. There's going to be some partnerships that develop that are faith filled. Some of you have critical friends. You sit over tables and you you chew on things that aren't part of the purpose of God. Can I tell you, get some new friends and begin to dream again that the power of Jesus is gonna be present in your life. And you watch God redeem the impossible because that's what he did in the book of Joshua and it's what he's doing in you. Now, this is what we're gonna do in response. Some of you are gonna get saved right now. You don't know Jesus, but you're gonna get to know him right now. So every head bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus as your savior, you haven't been following him, but today you know you need to make a confession of faith and make him your Lord. I want you to lift your hand. Come on, across this room, just lift it up. Thank you. Come on, who else? Just a spirit of faith and boldness. Come on, who else? You know you need to know Jesus as your savior. Thank you. Over to my far right, who else? You're making a decision to follow Jesus today. Church, pray this prayer with me, with these that are making this confession of faith. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of sins. I want to serve you with my whole life. I surrender to you. Cleanse me. Make me a new creation. I want to follow you the rest of my days. Thank you for redeeming me and washing me and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. I saw four hands, by the way, and let's give the Lord a big hand right now in this place. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do, and I'd love it if nobody walked out for the next five minutes. This is what I'd love us to do. Um, is I'd love us to just respond to the Lord in a song, in a spirit of faith. And then I'm gonna come back and I'll dismiss you. But I'd love to just respond in a spirit of faith and say, Lord, you are great. Lord, you are great. And let's get our perspective right in these next few moments. Could we do that? Come on, stand to your feet and let's sing this to him. 
as the band leads us. Come on.